Good morning, colleagues. My name is Romaldo Marazenger. I'm the Regional Program Manager for Africa here at the International Development Law Organization. I would like to welcome you all this morning to this webinar that focuses on access to justice in the context of COVID-19 in East Africa. Allow me to extend the appreciation of IDLO to all of the participating and cooperating institutions from our partners in Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Kenya. This webinar is indeed a testament to the good and close cooperation that we enjoy within the justice sector in those countries. Ladies and gentlemen, Allow me to say a few words about who we are as IDLO. IDLO is a global intergovernmental organization that is exclusively devoted to promoting the rule of law and sustainable development. In IDLO, when we consider the rule of law, it is more than a matter of the process. To us, the rule of law is an enabler of justice and development. Our definition of the rule of law is both a process as well as a substantive definition. For us, the rule of law is an integral part of sustainable development. It underpins social and economic progress, environmental protections, focusing on strong institutions and good governance, the formal legal frameworks, legal empowerment of people, ensuring equal opportunities and equitable access to basic services, due process and fair outcomes for all. IDLO law is a strong track record in implementing innovative and impactful rule of law projects and programs in Africa including support to deepening access to justice within the East African region. Ladies and gentlemen, on 11 March 2020, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a global pandemic. Governments in East Africa were quick to consider the pandemic a public health emergency and implemented responses and measures to contain the spread of the virus. The implementation of COVID-19 containment measures has certainly had an impact on access to justice across the region. And the effects felt by the citizens who really should be at the center of any justice delivery system, both formal and informal, have certainly been important and deserve for us to actually consider them and realize what lessons we can learn from the pandemic and our responses there too. It is in this context, ladies and gentlemen, that the discussion today presents an opportunity to learn from each other how the different institutions in East Africa have managed to ensure provision of access to justice within the context of COVID-19. This webinar will give us an opportunity to hear from representatives of both the supply and the demand side of justice on the status of access to justice in East Africa during the evolving time of the pandemic. We will be able to hear country specific adaptation responses to the emerging access to justice needs, especially for the most vulnerable and marginalized groups in our societies. The webinar today is divided into two panels. The first session to be moderated by my colleague, Teresa Mugaza, the country manager for IDLO in Kenya, will focus on the supply side of justice, exploring the responses of formal justice service providers during the pandemic. A second session moderated by Mr. Felix Kitenge, country manager for IDLO in Uganda, who focus on the experiences of justice seekers and legal aid service providers 
during the pandemic. It is my hope that contributions and interventions in this webinar will proffer appropriate response strategies to facilitate access to justice in the current context of COVID-19 and in future instances of similar crisis. Finally, it is my expectation and hope that the response strategies proposed during this webinar will indeed form relevant support, not only for IDLO, but for other development actors and justice sector actors in the various countries of programming within the region and beyond, as they seek to have appropriate responses to COVID-19 in the context of access to justice. With these brief remarks, I want to wish us all a very fruitful engagement during this webinar. And I take it this opportunity to hand over to my colleague, Teresa Mugadza, to introduce the participants for the first session of this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Romaldo. Um, and thank you everyone who's joined us this morning. Um, it's my privilege this morning to introduce the first set of panelists for this webinar. As Romaldo has said, we are really looking at how the justice institutions have been able to deliver justice during these trying times of COVID-19. And I have a very distinguished panel this morning, um, ably representing Uganda, is the Director of Public Prosecutions, the Honorable Justice Jane Francis Abodo, um, as well as the Honorable Justice Judith Omange, who is the Registrar of the High Court of Kenya, and finally, Dr. Bazire, who is the Acting Executive Director of the National Council on Administration of Justice, as well as the Chief of Staff in the Chief Justice's Office. I will speak a little, I will not speak too much to their bios because I don't want to eat into their speaking time. So I will introduce our first speaker for this panel, who is the Honorable Jane Francis Abodo, uh, a judge of the High Court of Uganda and presently the Director of Public Prosecutions. Madam, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of this conversation. I wish to thank in a very special way the International Development Law Organization, IDLO, for facilitating this webinar which is very timely considering the impact of COVID-19 on the criminal justice system as a whole. ODPP and IDLO have had cooperation and support since last year. And we thank you and hope for your continued support. Uh, um, uh, Teresa, do I, do I give my presentation uh, straight away? Yes, ma'am, you may please proceed. Ah, thank you so much. I particularly want to thank you Teresa, I don't know how to pronounce your second name, Mugaza, <laughs> Mugaza, the IDLO Kenya country manager, and Mr. Felix Chalo, the IDLO Uganda country manager, for extending this invitation to the ODPP Uganda. I also want to warmly welcome my fellow speaker on this panel and all participants following online from East Africa and other parts of the world. By way of introduction, I want to say that COVID-19 pandemic presented new and unprecedented challenges to both the ODPP and the criminal justice system as a whole in Uganda. The office as in the last seven months had to adapt and change how work is being done in light of the government interventions, which included a lockdown and other measures and standard operating procedures. The response of the ODPP has also had to be mindful of the impact of COVID-19 measures on the most marginalized and un underprivileged members of society. This include children, this include women, the terminally ill and the elderly. It is very disturbing that the cases of domestic violence have risen sharply during the COVID-19 pandemic in Uganda. This engagement is therefore very timely for us stakeholders to map out ways of ensuring that perpetrators of these cases are brought to book within the government prevention measures and SOPs. 
the Office of the DPP had a number of interventions. The ODPP has issued seven circulars since the lockdown was announced on the 18th of March, 2020 in Uganda. These circulars have helped to guide the office on the presidential directives and also protect the staff and other stakeholders from COVID-19. Some of these interventions briefly include, one, all operations of the ODPP have continued to be run, although with a skeletal staff, to have serious cases registered for plea taking and handling of bail applications. The Ministry of Public Service also issued circulars and said we should operate at 30%. And this, the ODPP has implemented. So most of our staff operate remotely. Officers in charge of field stations have been advised to maintain a skeletal staff to receive correspondences and visibly display all contact information for the office to enable the public access to ODPP services without physical interaction. The ODPP has the use of audiovisual links to handle court sessions, although it is still in a few courts in the country. The judiciary is also implementing the electronic case management information system and the ODPP already has also a prosecution case management information system platform in a number of stations in Kampala and some parts in the countryside. The ODPP has created a cybercrime unit at the anti-corruption department to handle offenses like illegal cyber payments, illegal economic transfer, or acquisitions of funds, terrorist financing, and money laundering. The ODPP is also in the process of securing laptops for all prosecutors to ensure that they can easily access the prosecution case management information system from any part of the country, since it will have all the information, especially the, 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 the police files will be uploaded on that, on that platform. The office has also been part of mobile courts inside the prisons. For example, in a prison nearby uh, Kampala, we had uh, to go and handle the prisons because it was, they had over 4,000 prisoners who were actually arrested because of the, uh, the, mostly because they were moving after a few hours. So we had to go into the prison and handle because now it was difficult to bring them out. We had to go into the prisons with the judge, with the, with the prosecutors and handled. And we handled about 2,463 cases inside the prisons. The office of the DPP has also been involved in many plea bargain sessions around the country which has resulted to between only June and July of this year, we have handled 506 cases, and these are all convictions. The Office of the DPP has also constituted a task force to handle the COVID-related cases, which were really low priority and minor, these 4,000, 4, over 4,000 cases. The more serious ones, and, and I withdrew all of them from the system after, because most of them had even stayed for two months plus. But most of the, uh, the high priority cases, we, I, we prioritize domestic violence. Those were for us high priority. Forgeries of movement stickers, they were high priority. And cases where police officers were assaulted during implementing of the presidential directives, we took that as priority cases and we allowed them to proceed in court. The Office of the DPP has also constituted a task force to weed out committed cases which are committed already to the high court. This is really we're trying to try and decongest the prisons and see if there are any cases which cannot proceed, we are actually remove them from the system. And we have handled, uh, from the time we started in May to date, we have handled 2,640 cases that have already been uh, that sort of case review. The police has also been advised to process suspects for court in capital cases, serious and other offenses that are likely to disrupt social harmony and public order. The complaints mechanism at the office of the DPP continues to operate, although with minimal human interaction. We encourage members of the public to send us uh, mail, complaints on mail, so that we, do, we don't, uh, we don't uh, get in, uh, into contact with the public so much. Also, uh, all prosecutors have been advised, considering when taking a decision to prosecute, especially the low priority cases, that the case, they must determine whether the, 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 there's a triable offense under the law and ensure that inquiries are complete because what inquiries are you going to carry out if you, the person is found operating business after the, after the what? Or they have opened the bar, which 
the, 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 the law says we, sh we should not operate bars now. So there's really not much inquiry. So inquiries should be complete. This is sanction only deserving cases with credible evidence. And then once these cases go to court, I have informed my prosecutors, we don't have to object to bail. If they can be released on bail with uh, with the uh, with sureties, that is okay because we want to, we don't want to congest the prisons. The office of the DPP has also held meetings with other stakeholders, including the judiciary, the prisons, and Uganda police, to ascertain what measures can be put in place to ensure pre-testing of suspects for COVID-19 before detention and remand. This is to protect already the prisoners who are who are in in custody. The ODPP has provided personal protective equipment like masks, gloves, sanitizers to its staff and members and at all access points in the offices. All staff were also cautioned to adhere to Ministry of Health guidelines on the personal health and hygiene to prevent the spread of COVID-19. In the case of suspected infection, the staff are advised to contact Ministry of Health and we, have, we also have one senior human resource officer who is the contact person. To, to coordinate this. And we had a case last week, the first case in the ODPP, but we, it was a case which uh, it was from outside, but it was a member of uh, the person who was working in the registry. And it, we were able to immediately isolate the person. We had tests run and uh, luckily we were all negative. And then uh, we also advised police to respect human rights of suspects in detention, including not violating the 48 hour rule. How has the COVID-19 impacted operations of the ODPP? Interference with court hearings, which may lead to case backlog and many cases have lost position. Interference with investigations, because now the investigators cannot go to the field because we fear interaction with the members of the public. Prison authorities have to hold some convicts. Some convicts have served their sentences, but they can't be released and budget cuts on some institutions and the ODPP was one of those that was affected uh, for the quota for release we were only given 5% of our budget, which really, really affected us uh, very, very much, our operations. There's the increase in numbers of prisoners arrested and detained for disobeying presidential directives on the fight against COVID-19. The most vulnerable victims like women and children could not access police stations to report cases at the time of the lockdown. So, and yet there were many cases of domestic violence at the time. Some sc school going children have been home since the schools were closed. This has also led to increased cases of sexual abuse and unwanted pregnancies. Some remedial measures that have been taken for prosecution of mostly sexual gender based violence cases. We, have, we use prosecution led investigations to ensure that quality of evidence gathered is good. The ODPP is now engaged with both response and prevention of SGBB cases because we realize that we cannot only act on, it's like just surgery, you know, waiting, firefighting. So we said we should now also go in and do some kind of prevention. So the office of the DPP is involved in response by uh, uh, doing uh, talk shows on, on TVs, radio talk shows as well, educating the public about domestic violence. And um, we, we see that that is really having impact. And the ODPP has also been part of sensitization meetings with the police as they do community policing, we have joined in. The ODPP has developed uh, information education, communication materials like flyers, which are disseminated to the public. This, this material contains information about what the ODPP does. It gives our toll free numbers. It gives our official email and uh, the public to lodge their complaints effectively during this COVID-19 period. And we are really overwhelmed by the number of emails sent. Oh, so this is really working for us. The ODPP has also empowered prosecutors on how to handle SGBV cases in a victim-friendly manner. For instance, the launch of the ODPP handbook on prosecuting child-related cases in Uganda. Some of the good practices that I can share is that we created in the ODPP a Department of Gender, Children and Sexual Offenses basically just focuses on only those cases. We have child-friendly rooms at some of the stations and, and, and also at the headquarters where children come and play instead of being in a courtroom, they just be in a, in a, in a, in a child-friendly room with toys and, and, they, and 
also we ensure that when we are actually having these cases in court, the, the, the cases are had in chambers and not in open court. And also we, we have introduced anatomical dolls as demonstration tools. Instead of you, the prosecutor, asking the victim that uh, when this uh, man was molesting you, where did he touch? And most times we used to have to force the victims to touch their private parts, which was really also uh, dehumanizing and at the same time re-traumatizing the victims. But now we have the dolls, so we have a female doll and a male doll. So they just they, we just tell them, demonstrate for us what the, 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 the accused did. And they, they do it very, very freely. So we also use uh, victim impact assessment reports, which helps so much when they're doing sentencing so that we know what was the impact. Because most of these cases come into the system after two years, after three years. So we want to know what was the impact at the time when that happened. And th those really help in sentencing. Prosecution-led guidelines. We have the guidelines which help prosecutors in handling these cases. Some court sessions have been held in children's remand homes. We take the sessions there instead of children being brought out. We also have faced a number of challenges. The long stay of cases in the system. We have, when we are doing this case review, the, the, the oldest case has been 2004. You can imagine a case being in the system for 16 years and someone is in the prisons waiting. And then we, have a, we don't have a witness protection law. So perpetrators sometimes are very close to the victims. Most of these are fathers, are brothers, are cousins. So if we don't have this, um, this, uh, this law to protect the witnesses. It is sometimes the cases get lost. And then we also have language barriers for the victims. So you find that sometimes you, 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 the translation, the, the, all, the all case is lost in translation. So that's also a challenge for us. And then also the effect of crimes on victims, treatment, dropping out of school and all that. The cost of doing medical examination is really like under $2. But sometimes people in the, in the villages cannot even afford a dollar, you know. So this is also becoming a challenge for us. And then the standard operating procedures issued by government have no provisions on how to handle cases of children during this pandemic. And there was limited rehabilitation programs. There's lim limited rehabilitation programs in the country. So we need to have, the, I think there's only one that we have for the for. For children and then we have um, lack of legal representation for children and other victims lack of sufficient capacity in ict like laptops we, we are telling our staff that we are operating at 30 percent and we are saying 70 percent stay at home work at home work remotely but in essence what they're doing what we're doing is that we're telling them just to sit at home because they don't have laptop they don't have they don't have uh, desktops so it is, it is really a challenge. And we are saying that now our ICT has really to, to, to come up because it is what we, we, we shall depend on so much during this time of COVID-19. And we are also now, most of the trainings are online. You pick people from up country and they don't have a laptop, they don't have a desktop. So they're actually missing a lot during this time. So uh, those are the ones that I can share for the office of the DPP, how it has affected us. And of course, it trickles down to other um, stakeholders as well, because we work as a chain from the police to the courts, to the prisons. So that's what I can, I, can, I can share with you today. I thank you all for listening, for God and my country. God bless you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Judge Abodo. We really appreciate those uh, remarks. Can I just remind the attendees to the seminar that we will be having a question and answer session after the presentations from our three panelists on this first panel. So please keep your questions coming on the chat and on the Q&A, we will address them. We've already noted, I think, a couple of uh, remarks that are aimed at uh, Justice Abodo uh, with respect to the response to SGBB. We will, of course, discuss that, as I said, after the presentations. It is now my pleasure to invite Honorable Judith Omange, the Registrar of the High Court of Kenya, uh, to make her presentation on how, from the judicial perspective, uh, the response to COVID-19 and the provision of justice has been ongoing in Kenya. Um, Madam Justice, you have the chair. Honorable Omange. Uh, 
Um, Honorable Omanke, do we have you? Tressa, we seem it seems we might have, she might have dropped off, uh, but I see that Dr. Bozira is online. So I think we'll move on to the presentation by Dr. Bozira while we try and reconnect Honorable Judith Omange. Uh, Dr. Dr. Conrad Bozira is the exec acting executive director of the National Council on the Administration of Justice in Kenya, and also the chief of staff in the office of the chief justice. Dr. Bozira overs uh, oversees the National Council on the Administration of Justice, which is responsible for coordination of justice actors in Kenya. And I know that the NCAJ has played a very important role in ensuring that uh, access to justice is provided to justice seekers and also to facilitate, I think, coordination between justice institutions. So I'd like to invite you, Dr. Bazira, to make your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Teresa, for uh, this opportunity. I'd like to thank the IDLO for organizing and uh, putting this uh, together. And uh, I've participated in previous uh, sessions that uh, the IDLO has uh, organized on this general theme and uh, very enriching and informative uh, sessions to deal with the unique uh, circumstances that uh, countries and the justice systems around the world are uh, dealing with. So therefore, just to join you, the previous uh, speaker, Justice Abodo, to uh, thank you for these initiatives that uh, enrich our perspectives in access to justice and administration of uh, justice. Uh, so <clears throat> as uh, uh, Teresa has mentioned, um, uh, I'm the exe acting executive director for the National Council on the Administration of Justice. And this is a statutory body that um, brings together state and non-state actors in the justice sector with the key objective of ensuring that we have a coordinated and a cohesive uh, justice sector with a seamless uh, delivery of the administration of uh, justice. And maybe um, <clears throat> just to start from um, at the very beginning, um, I see a comment that I'm not audible. I hope that uh, participants can hear me. Maybe my volume is at maximum. Uh, I hope now you can uh, hear me. Maybe I can raise my voice a bit. Uh, so we had the first case of uh, COVID-19 in the country. It was announced on 12th uh, of uh, March. And of course, at that time, because of um, sort of the panic and anxiety that gripped uh, the world, there was also uh, anxiety here after the announcement of uh, that. So the first step that the National Council on the Administration of Justice took, or the justice sector uh, generally, was to convene a crisis meeting, I think two days later on 15th of March, and a collective decision was taken. This National Council on the Administration of Justice is headed by the Chief Justice, and it brings together heads of agencies in the public and private sector in the, in, in the justice uh, chain, and a collective decision was taken to scale down operations in the justice sector, especially those that require uh, physical uh, contact, and this was mainly just to uh, step back and look at the situation and see what measures uh, need to be taken um, uh, in order to ensure that we minimize the spread and uh, uh, we curb, we, we control the spread of uh, COVID-19. Now, the, on 15th of March, the Chief Justice, who is the chair of the council, uh, put together a subcommittee that um, is, uh, that is chaired by the president of the Court of Appeal. And this basically was a subcommittee uh, composed of uh, senior officers from all justice sector agencies in the private, uh, in, the, in the state and non-state uh, institutions. And this basically was to assess and recommend to the council decisions to be taken and uh, gradual resumption of uh, services and monitoring uh, the situation. At the time and until very recently, there's been a rise, if you follow the government uh, statistics, in uh, cases and uh, deaths uh, of, uh, related to COVID-19 and 
the decisions in the justice sector were uh, after considering uh, the statistics and uh, all that. And basically, a number of decisions were taken. First, um, uh, maybe if I can just mention a few to give uh, perspective is that uh, there was a rapid prison decongestion exercise that was undertaken. And between March and uh, today, we have over 13,000 persons who have walked out of uh, prisons. And I'm going to give the categories of those that uh, walked out. We had uh, convicts on long term sentences whose terms were coming to an end, less than six months. We have laws uh, in Kenya that allow the high court to review those uh, sentences and uh, commute. Then we also have those who are arrested and put into fiscal custody for minor offenses, six months or less. Those files were also reviewed by the high court. Then we also have um, those who were remanded in custody. Cases are not done. And uh, we, if you check in most prisons across the country, especially before COVID, this was the majority population in the prisons. And we have uh, 129 prisons uh, in the country and far exceeding the capacity of uh, the persons who are there. And therefore the prison population was vulnerable and it presented a very high risk uh, category and therefore the prison decongestion uh, measures. So files who are retrieved, physical files from the courts and uh, placed before judges uh, for review. Magistrates, because majority of the offenses, except murder cases, um, are in the lower courts, My magistrates called for files of those who are remanded in custody and uh, reviewed the bail and bond terms and communicated these to prison authorities who got in touch with their families and counsel who organized them for this um, convicts or persons in custody uh, to, 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 to get out of uh, prisons. And therefore we have had a substantial, uh, if you look at the prison figures, sometimes in November last year, we had a conference, we were told that there were over 55,000 um, persons held within the 129 prisons in the country. And right now, I don't have the exact uh, statistics. We could uh, get that at some time, but uh, it is around 43,000 or less. And this is a result of that rapid uh, decongestion. I've seen around the world, uh, many of the legal systems had this particular uh, initiative and it is, co it is completely understandable that you would want to decongest because um, the, 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 the manner in which the disease spreads, uh, the prisons uh, form, a very um, vulnerable population. And that is why I've dwelt on that uh, for a bit. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of uh, the other uh, aspects of uh, justice, the, the a decision was taken uh, by the National Council on the Administration of Justice that because we have that uh, in the law, that the police stations, police officers, would give police bonds to minor offenses. So um, those arrested for minor offenses uh, would get police uh, bonds and um, with the terms which deemed reasonable by the police. And until such a time when there was resumption of uh, court activity, and as I say, there was gradual upscaling of uh, activities uh, during this time and cases are going on but uh, the physical custody of um, uh, persons who have been arrested, uh, that was highly discouraged, except for serious offenses. And these were maybe murder, uh, robbery with violence, or um, uh, sexual, se sexual offenses uh, such as rape. Those ones, uh, plea taking, arrests, and physical custody uh, was there. And as the disease progressed and we realized that uh, we have to, the justice uh, chain has to go on. When she comes on, she'll speak about it in further detail, but in the judiciary, actually in the Nairobi region and uh, with the assistance majorly of IDLO, we have managed to implement an e-filing uh, system and in all courts in Nairobi, it is virtual. And the main motivation was the COVID-19 and the spread through handling 
of physical documents and all that. Those plans were there in the past, but the uh, pandemic provided an impetus for ensuring that uh, we leverage on technology and going forward, that is one of the gains that uh, we have as the justice uh, sector. And the MOH, that is the Ministry of Health also, yeah, just like the, it is the case in Uganda, as you've had, issued very extensive guidelines for courts and for all justice sector institutions. And these have been guiding us, we have been reflecting on that and every step taken has been in consultation with the Ministry of Health. And also in Kenya and elsewhere, I think there was a rise of um, sexual and gender-based violence. And I think part of this is because families were in a pros, uh, close proximity for a long time. Uh, children are vulnerable with relatives and um, some of these crimes, maybe you get to hear of them, some you don't get to hear of them. And the circumstances of uh, the lockdown and uh, uh, existence of uh, uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the conditions uh, during this uh, pandemic led to this. Uh, there was a, a rise in uh, sexual uh, offenses. But, uh, the, 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 we have seen also partnership between community uh, civil society organizations and uh, the police, especially in tackling and uh, developing strategies for countering uh, sexual and gender-based uh, violence together with the Directorate of Public Prosecutions. And this, as uh, we are yet to assess the impact of that, but at least there is a sustained um, uh, initiative uh, by civil society organizations, especially to uh, address this uh, emerging challenge of uh, sexual offenses on the rise during this time. Let me just go to the major lessons from the justice sector and I conclude uh, my presentation. First, I think uh, uh, what we've realized here as the justice sector is that there's need for a recovery plan whenever this happens. In the future, we may not have COVID, but we may have a different pandemic that uh, affects uh, the uh, administration of uh, justice. And this is uh, sector-wide and specific institutions to develop uh, their uh, plans. Technology is very important, not only during pandemic times, but especially during uh, pandemic times because you can uh, reduce physical contact as we have realized with e-filing. Now we have uh, over 5,000 matters filed uh, in, in Nairobi courts only and we are expanding regionally and it's efficient. There's teething problems, but overall we are not turning back on that. And also there's need for continuous policy and legislative review. Right now we have a, a subsidiary legislation pending in parliament to support the administration of justice, especially through electronic means. And this, uh, I think we are addressing the current situation, but we need broad-based uh, reforms and reflection at all, the at all times in order to ensure that the uh, wills of justice are not uh, grounded. And then also, a consistent and uh, adequate funding for state institutions in the administration of justice. We have seen there's need for budgeting and uh, addressing all aspects of justice. And uh, this need not be much. For instance, if you look at what we've spent in uh, e-filing and other initiatives, uh, it's a reasonable amount which can be balanced with other priorities uh, in, the, in, the, in the sector. So uh, thank you very much. I will leave other comments to the discussions. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you very much, Dr. Bozire. Um, Honorable Manke, can you hear me now? I understand that Honorable Judge Omange is online, but she can't seem to hear me. Um, we'll try it for another minute or two. Honorable Omange, are you online? We don't seem to be able to hear her. Um, so what I will do while we try um, with while we try with IT to see if we can bring her back is maybe to already go to some of the questions that have been raised for the panelists that have spoken. Um, I have two questions so far for Justice Abodo, and they are with respect to the response to sexual and gender-based violence. Um, I think the first question is of course 
we've heard you speak to some of the uh, ways that you address sexual and gender-based violence in the context of the courtroom. But the question was, what are the specific measures you have taken to address sexual and gender-based violence in the context of COVID-19? So what are the new measures outside of the already existing measures that you seem to have in place for the prosecution of sexual and gender-based violence matters? Um, so what adaptations and new interventions? And then the second question was, how is the Office of the uh, Public Prosecutions operating on a limited budget? So the second question relates to how you've been able to continue to provide service uh, given that you're operating with skeletal staff, and as you say, on only 5% of your budget. So I'd like you to address those two questions, Justice Abodo, if you may. Thank you so much, Teresa, and uh, thank you, uh, Beatrice, for those questions. I will uh, start with um, the second question on funding. When, uh, this, uh, uh, when the lockdown was announced in March, Oh, a number of things happened. And of course, I think we didn't, everybody didn't know what to do because it all took all of us by surprise. So a number of institutions were declared non-essential, others were declared essential and they could continue operating. And uh, at the beginning, the office of the DPP was also declared non-essential. So that meant it also affected the budgets. Yes, I can see the smile on Teresa's face. Yes, we were non-essential. <laughs> So because of that, uh, the full budget was not released. It was just only 5% was released, 95% was withheld and uh, diverted to the Ministry of Health and, and other institutions which were involved in the fight against COVID-19. But uh, we had a number of interactions. Uh, of course, before we could have interactions with the with government, we had a number of our longtime friends, UN women, uh, we had the UNFPA, we had UNICEF, we had the Austrian Embassy. They all came up and really um, uh, helped us out, especially on protective gear, uh, because most of, but we had first of all to put ourselves to be essential. And they realized that if police can be essential and then uh, judiciary can be essential, how can the, D the office of the DPP not be essential because we are generally the, 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 we are the ones who, who are the, um, the chain, uh, we are the ones connecting that. The cases have to go to court through us. So we first of all engage government and they release some of our funds. So it uh, helped us a bit. And then we had, uh, we couldn't, of course, uh, manage the protective gear. And yet we needed to, to have our prosecutors go to court. And uh, most of the cases that we took as priority cases were uh, gender-based violence cases because the, the, we realized they were the ones on the increase. So we had to first give our, our um, UN women were the first to come to our rescue and they gave us uh, PPEs and we were able to actually have our frontline staff uh, have protective gear and actually go and handle cases of uh, um, sexual gender-based violence. And then we also had UNFPA coming up and, um, and, and saying we can actually continue to have uh, sessions because they had already sponsored like two special sessions which were targeting gender-based violence, violence cases only. And uh, the third one was in the offing, but when the lockdown came up and then we actually read at which, like as we speak now, we, we are coming to the end of the third one and about 700 cases uh, handled. <clears throat> and it's really targeting only gender-based violence cases only. So we, we, we have had to, of course, change the way that we, we are working. We, I, I went out and, uh, and on a, on a uh, to, to, to go to organizations and ask them if they could, uh, really save us out because I needed about 300 laptops to be able to have prosecutors. Even in the 21st century, most of our offices in the, in the countryside 
don't even have desktops. So I now said we have to change now the way we do. We are do, working remotely. People need connectivity. So the Austrian embassy went ahead and uh, donated 24 laptops for the office of the DPP. And we have gone ahead and really given them to, to we have uh, allocated to up country stations just to help them uh, come in, in terms. And most of the, about uh, 10 of these laptops will go to the Department of Gender Based Violence. Uh, because there, we, we think that those are our priority cases that we should put on the forefront and handle them as, as priority. And of course, uh, at the end of the day, there is need for, uh, I have about uh, 400 prosecutors, about only a hundred of them have laptops. So at the end of the day, I need to have all these prosecutors connected somewhere in some way or another. So that's how we have been able to really handle most of this, uh, this these cases and then the funding issue. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Justice Abodo. Uh, just two follow up questions. Uh, there's a question about what is being done to ensure the safety of victims of sexual and gender based violence is their cases are being prosecuted because most of them are not safe at all. So we've seen that, as you said in your presentation, a lot of these cases are on the rise because you know women and young children are in the hole, and so what measures are in place or is the state put in place to ensure protection for those that may actually be exposed to SGBV in the context of the home? And then the second question relates to the uh, issue around decongestion of prisons. Um, the question specifically spoke to what measures um, you have put in place with respect to the prison population and how have cases and investigations and conditions in, pr in prisons changed as a result of COVID-19. Thank you, Teresa. I'll start with the second one of the congestion in the prisons. In the, the Ugandan prisons, even before COVID-19, there was already congestion. There was already congestion in the prisons and with the coming in of the pandemic, it actually got worse. The prisons authorities had to like collapse a number of prisons to create room for now the new uh, entrants who were, of course, because crime continued to be to be anyway committed even during the lockdown. So uh, most of the prisons had to be collapsed to create room for the new ones. But even the new ones which were created, they the quickly became full because you know that the, at the time people were not even uh, getting bail in the courtroom. People would just appear in court and they uh, taken to custody. People would just be appearing in court, taken to custody. And you know that the office of the DP was also sparsely, uh, we were not really on the ground. So most of the cases were just taken to court and people um, were, were what were, were remanded. So what happened was that when we came up around May, we had a discussion, we had a conversation with the stakeholders and we said, how do we handle the prison congestion? Because uh, if we, God forbid, if the, 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 there is a, an outbreak in the prisons and uh, not just of the disease, we are also thinking about every two weeks, the prisons, uh, uh, Every actually every day, I think three days in a week, they would have visitors. They would allow in visitors. But now because of the lockdown, no visitors are going in. So you see, they are not appearing in court. Nothing seems to be happening. They are locked up there. They are actually locked up from the outside world. So that is just uh, uh, what it can lead to, to a lot of prison, uh, prison breaks. So we said we need to decongest the prisons. How do we do that? We did a number of things. One. I decided that those cases which were arose out of the um, the presidential directives, mostly low priority people who have got walking after 5 p.m. because the, the that time by 5 p.m. everybody should have been home. People who have got operating their shops after 5 p.m. I said those ones that have been in for about one month. I should withdraw those cases. So I withdrew those cases from the system and they, they, they amounted to about 4,000, slightly over 4,000 cases. So that really decongested a number of prisons in the, what, in the, in the, in the, in the country. Then we also said, let's, let's now do plea bargains. 
let's do plea bargain so that there's something that is being done. There were those people who are locked up because they stole a chicken, because they stole a bunch of matoke, and they've been locked up there. Why don't we go and do plea bargain? Those who really committed the offense, they can benefit from it. Most of them actually were given a caution. So that also decongested the prisons. We, we handled over, between just in two months, we handled over 500 cases and people were released. And we also decided to do a bit of, uh, why don't we go into the prisons and actually handle people who want to do bail, who want to come out. That, that those offenses, especially those ones which are not violence related. So those people can be released. So some of the people were, were being released on bail. And we had to, 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 to create mobile prisons, mobile courts, mobile courts in the prison. So we, we, we had to get out of the way and say, we cannot bring out the prisoners we had to go in. So we would just have tents erected in the prison facilities. And then the judge is there, the magistrate is there, the prosecutor is there, and the defense lawyers are there. So those are some of the things that we did. And for the safety of the, of the victims, it is a big challenge. That one is really a big challenge because most of these victims, most of these victims, the perpetrators are very close relatives. And it's just a tip that I reported. Very, very many cases are not reported because it is either the father who is the perpetrator and most of the time the father is the one who is the, the economic power in the house. So the woman cannot report the man if he's taken. The issue is the same one who will come and say, please release, release, release my husband. So we have, we have decided that let's go on talk shows. We have been so active uh, in uh, radio talk shows and, and TVs talking about the ills of, uh, of, of uh, sexual gender-based violence violence and uh, telling people of what they should they should not leave their young girls at home alone with neighbors that's the time that they are actually being uh, molested and we have done a number of them so we we have and there are a number of um, uh, where police have kept uh, some of the victims uh, but you know we we have about i think about five of them five locations where we keep this some of the victims but those are not enough you know, eh? because the cases, uh, sexual gender-based cases actually form like three quarters of the criminal cases in the system. So those are not enough. So that's why we, are, we have not really done much about the safety of the victims. I, I, must, I must be frank with that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Justice Abodo. And I see the questions keep coming, but I think I'll move on to uh, responses from Dr. Bozira. There are two questions that have come in for Dr. Bazire. The first one, of course, I think is a follow-up on the sexual and gender-based violence question that has already been asked to uh, Justice Abodo. And I think specifically in the context of Kenya, the question is what is being done to ensure, uh, what measures have you put in place to ensure that the judiciary and ODPP accelerate and dispose cases of SGBV in the context of Kenya? Um, and also what are, what are the, what measures have been put in place to use and rely on the Sexual Offenses Act and Rules of Court of 2014, as well as the 2016 Active Case Management Guidelines? That's the first question, Dr. Bozire. The second one relates to prison decongestion. Um, and the first question is, which of the prison decongestion measures should, they, should be applied even after COVID-19? Clearly, we have seen that it is possible to decongest prisons in a very short space of time as you made uh, reference to in your presentation. So what measures from what lessons in terms of decongesting prisons I think can be learned post COVID-19 that can be used long-term I think to increase to decrease uh, prison populations. And related to that, do you foresee or do you recommend a broader application of the diversion policy that is diverting from the uh, correctional services system, so to speak? And then finally, there's also a question relating to um, Oh, it's also related to decongestion. So I think I'll leave it to those two, Dr. Bozira, if you can respond. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Teresa, and uh, the participants who have raised these uh, uh, questions. Um, <clears throat> so maybe uh, let me just start with the, the, the one on uh, decongestion of uh, prisons. Um, I just I need to point out that uh, the Kenya has a legal framework for prison decongestion, 
those familiar with the criminal justice system, we have the Community Service Orders uh, Act, we, under which uh, there is a, a community service as an alternative to punishment, uh, as an alternative to physical uh, custody, and is one of the decongestion measures. So one of the benefits is that uh, we already had a framework uh, when the crisis uh, struck. But if you look at the statistics uh, from before, it's like there was not uh, uh, active use of this law as was expected when the law uh, was uh, passed. I think COVID-19 presented the opportunity to reactivate uh, this and maybe uh, get the systems uh, going. In terms of uh, the, the, the approach that uh, happened, uh, basically court registries across uh, the country isolated and identified files for review by the High Court, and we had uh, skeleton staff uh, during the scaling down uh, who worked to identify uh, this. And the CSOs has a coordination office, and there's a national coordinator uh, who worked with the registries to identify these files. During the scaling down, before a uh, resumption of physical uh, activity in the courts, uh, judges were not sitting. They, for some time during the decongestion, uh, were at home, some were writing judgments, uh, but there were no court activities uh, going on. And therefore they were contacted from the registries to go and peruse the files and uh, issue orders. And I think that created the environment for the rapid uh, decongestion. Uh, I agree to some extent that uh, this experience presents a wider um, approach to decongestion, maybe for the longer term, but I think that also presents uh, some um, uh, challenges, as is the case with every uh, policy initiative. You, you may realize, and I think that there is not yet a comprehensive assessment, but there's quite a number of convicts who rejoined uh, society. There are those who are given alternative uh, punishment, but the, the structures uh, to supervise pro probation and aftercare, uh, they are not adequate. If you look at the annual report uh, of the justice sector, you realize the probation and aftercare services, they are really strained in terms of resources. So once you put this to be in the longer term, then uh, without uh, proper capacity for probation, and after care and the supervision of alternative punishment and uh, all that is also a crisis. So in, if we are to put this in the longer term and uh, assume that uh, this will be the rate, then there has to be corresponding resources to support uh, accompanying uh, uh, processes if we are to do that uh, in, the, in the longer term. Um, on the issue of uh, sexual and gender-based uh, violence, uh, unfortunately, I may not speak into the details of what uh, the judiciary and the ODPP have done. From a very general level, um, I know that uh, the ODPP has very detailed statistics and um, information on the way in which these offenses have occurred. And as I mentioned earlier, there's also uh, civil society organizations that are involved in uh, gender uh, issues who have engaged uh, with the police. I think for preventive measures, capacity building in handling of these cases with the police and all that, but uh, unfortunately, I don't have the concrete measures that have been taken uh, to enhance uh, these uh, processes. One thing I can mention from the judiciary perspective and the issues we hear from the courts is that um, physical uh, court processes, especially uh, in the criminal justice uh, have to take place. And this is because uh, facilities to support uh, video link trials and uh, all that from the courts. Uh, the prisons are uh, grossly uh, under facilitated to undertake these uh, measures and that has slowed down. Some of the cases which have proceeded uh, virtually uh, are on civil with the lawyers and the courts, but uh, prison matters proceed, but there is a strain of resources uh, in the prison uh, facilities. And uh, maybe at another Dr. Bozira, are you still on? Uh, you can't hear me. I think we lost you for a moment there. Okay, I don't know at what point, <laughs> but uh, uh, I was saying uh, uh, for SGBV uh, cases, uh, maybe, did you hear that point? Yes. 
Okay, so I was saying now on diversion, yes. uh, the, the ODPP has put in place this. There has been uh, a lot of initiatives uh, and, and, and I think it's one of the ways uh, in which uh, we can uh, support uh, the, the, the efficient administration of uh, uh, criminal justice. Of course, uh, if this process is uh, managed effectively to ensure that uh, there are only and the impact of it will be legitimate and uh, will actually support in the administration of uh, justice. Thank you very much, uh, Therese. Thank you very much, Dr. Bozire, and thank you very much to Justice Abodo. Um, we have a number of questions going to speak. May I request your indulgence, participants? Your questions have been noted. I think the key question that we would like both Justice Abodo and Dr. Bozire to address at the end of the second panel, if they may, is the question around how the coordination of justice institutions has facilitated access to justice for justice seekers, and also how it has made it easier for justice institutions to provide service. As I said, I would request that you reflect on that question and respond to it in the plenary after the second panel. We are looking at our time and we are not doing so well. So I'd like to say thank you very much, Dr. Bozira. Thank you very much, Honorable Justice Abodo, for your presentations. Please reflect on the question on coordination and what lessons you can share with other countries in the region. And at this point, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Mr. Felix Chialo, the country manager for IDLO in Uganda, to take over the next panel. Felix, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Teresa, and thank you to um, the panelists in our first session. So we now shift our gears and we will move to hear the experiences of non-state justice providers, particularly on how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted uh, um, the justice needs of communities and strategies that they've adopted in ensuring sustenance of access to justice, including legal aid to our people during this difficult time. Based on these experiences, we shall also seek to develop a working model or models of ways in which the justice sector can better respond to the continuing challenges occasioned by this pandemic and to prepare for such future public emergencies. To take us through this, I am honored to introduce three panelists from Rwanda, Tanzania, and Uganda. And I want to start off uh, with from Rwanda uh, with Mr. Andrews Kananga, who is Executive Director of the Legal Aid Forum uh, in Rwanda, uh, position he has held since 2008. Uh, Mr. Kananga was previously the Senior Legal Advisor to the Special Courts that was set up to handle prosecution of genocide suspects, and also was one of the three legal experts who supported Uganda, uh, Rwanda in the development of the legal aid uh, policy. Uh, Mr. Kananga, I want to um, hand over to you uh, to be able to share the experiences from, uh, from Rwanda. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I have uh, something to share. Let me try that. <clears throat> can you see the presentation? Yes, we can. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to be very brief. Thank you, IGRO, for inviting me to speak on the important uh, topic on access to legal aid services uh, during uh, this period of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, I'll be very brief. My presentation is going to be focused on what we did as the Legal Aid Forum. I, I don't think um, I have to speak much about Legal Aid Forum, but just to say that uh, Legal Aid Forum is uh, uh, a legal aid service provider in Rwanda for, for many years now. And um, we have, we are a network of uh, 40 organizations uh, across the country providing legal aid. So my, my focus uh, is going to be on services we provided, uh, giving some experiences and some of the innovations that we, we have uh, been able to adopt as an organization. Of course, working with state. Maybe just to add that, um, um, from what I've heard from uh, the previous panel, the experiences, although I'm not going to speak on behalf of Rwanda as a country, I'm speaking on behalf of my organization, but I think the experiences are quite the same. So but, uh, let me just start off by saying some of the emerging issues, and um, again, these have been alluded to by previous speakers. 
the services were very limited because of the pandemic, because of the lockdown. It's obvious, and uh, it's, it is common to all countries. Some legal aid service providers, especially non-state legal aid service providers, um, faced uh, challenges of uh, downsizing staff, uh, decreasing resources. And, uh, there are also increases of violation of due process, as was indicated in most countries. Not intentional in our case, but because of the extent to which states had to address, uh, I mean, to handle the measures. You know, you have to look go down, you have to speak the movement, you have to uh, do everything. And sometimes this doesn't go well with citizens, as, as you know. So some of these uh, measures led to violations of due process and some rights. So courts were, courts were closed for a moment. The uh, investigation, prosecution were not working effectively. And the lack of infrastructure, especially when we, after after April, we resumed some work and uh, it was decided that uh, uh, court work was going to resume, but uh, through uh, video uh, conferencing. So trials have been happening up now, even in some courts they are using uh, uh, video conferencing trials. So lack of infrastructure, I think uh, from Uganda did mention that. And then the other challenge, the general challenge was the access to lawyers, as I think people mentioned. So these are not new, it's common to all of us. And um, we are currently uh, concluding a survey to see how uh, these measures um, have affected the sector, just a second round. The survey is trying to show the extent to which uh, the services were affected and uh, we are getting perception from the citizens, from the practitioners, citizens uh, and lawyers. And the uh, preliminary findings indicate that 90% of the regulated service providers that we interviewed, uh, 91% um, think that COVID has negatively impacted, affected access to justice. 91% uh, again said legal services should be considered as essential service. It was a very, uh, a very heated debate here uh, because essential services would minimally operate. And um, the question from practitioners was that, um, why can't legal aid, uh, why can't access to, uh, I mean, legal aid be essential, especially as someone said, I think from Uganda, although the pandemic, uh, I mean, the lockdown measures were being enforced by people who still commit crimes, they were being arrested and, uh, lawyers were denied to access clients. We also interviewed judges. 85% uh, of the judges interviewed said COVID has negatively impacted the work they do. Especially some of them had to work from home. Uh, IT infrastructure was a very big problem. Interestingly, also judges think and believe that um, legal services, especially legal aid, counsel, services of lawyers should be considered essential. We also interviewed investigators and 80% stated that COVID-19 also impacted more or less like the judges, uh, their work. 86% uh, also think that uh, legal services are, should be considered uh, uh, essential services. With only 50% indicated that um, they were able to uh, follow due process. Advocates, lawyers, 60% indicated that their clients we are not able to pay them. So the, uh, the, 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 the lawyers were affected. And 100% of them agreed that uh, legal aid services should be considered essential. And then the beneficiaries that we tried to interview, 28% were able to communicate with detainees, but 85% think also that legal aid services should be considered essential. They also reported delays in prosecution, limited access to legal aid, uh, limited uh, access to prisons, and many others. This is just an example. So the most important part of my presentation is uh, how did we cope? So the Legal Aid Forum, I'm, I'm giving a case study of uh, our organization. So we had a lot of innovations. We are currently having a project. So three ways we did this. One of them is through um, the hotline, 1022, that was open throughout the lockdown period. And then um, we could receive calls, uh, our staff, 
could receive calls from their homes. But there's also an important project we are, we are running. Probably some of you have heard about this, if you, are able, if you have been um, interacting with the LAF. We have um, 845 services we provide. It's an IT-based uh, technology that we are using to provide legal aid services. This is not, did not, um, it was established in 2018. It was not meant for COVID, but uh, it was really very, um, very helpful. Uh, during the, this, this, uh, the lockdown period. So the project uh, that we're implementing started in 2018 um, and uh, it came as a result of uh, these different surveys that we make that indicated that our people have still uh, to make long distances to access uh, services. So uh, essentially this platform is meant to do that, but we saw that um, it was really very helpful during COVID. It's called 845 Legal Services. And um, this is one of the pictures of uh, legal officers operating the call center attached as a, uh, attached to this uh, 845 service. And I will show you. Uh, I'll tell you how it works. So this it has three uh, two ways of uh, uh, usage. One is to pre-record information uh, in form of uh, that will be accessed in form of interactive voice recording by uh, clients or the population in general. And we have a lot of legal content that is. Uh, uploaded you can see we have about uh, 95 legal content grouped into uh, eight thematic groups uh, laws related to gender succession and family land expropriation procedural laws and many other uh, laws that we uh, uh, we put on the platform for people to access uh, using simple mobile phone technologies and it has um, uh, so one way is to uh, you know um, access the what we call USSD text. The texts are also simplified. I mean, the, the laws are also simplified in form of a text. You can read uh, as text, uh, and then you get to be advised uh, by yourself on the platform. But it also has the, uh, the uh, uh, what we call IVR, interactive uh, voice recording, uh, which is more similar like uh, the, the text, but this time in the audio format. And then uh, if you are not satisfied with all these options, you, you have a chance now to get in touch with our call center. It's a very complicated process. Maybe we will need, it can take time for me to explain. So we have a call center, as I said, and uh, the, the good thing about this, the call center is, uh, is built within our secretariat, but during COVID, our lawyers were able to operate from their homes. So, and uh, these are impressive figures uh, of people who were able to access the platform during COVID. So IVR, uh, 79,000 79, people were able to interact with, with our lawyers and they received legal advice. Uh, and then 32 people were able to read different legal texts on the platform. And then 2,000 people were able to uh, call back to book a call and talk to our lawyers. And during all that process, we identified uh, 22, 23 cases that needed the attention of lawyer. And uh, as the court are open now, we are dealing with this lawyer. But overall, the platform, the performance of the platform is very impressive. With about 2 million people who have accessed the platform, either through uh, the text uh, method we call USASD or uh, the IVR. And uh, 130 cases have emerged as a result of, these are critical cases that have emerged as a result of the use of the platform. Toll free, uh, I think everyone talked about toll free, so I'm not going to talk much about this, but it also helped because it, uh, people could call during the lockdown and um, they could report a lot of cases uh, that included GBV um, and many other type of cases. Uh, so these, these are results from the toll free. But another innovation, so although we are, we are in lockdown, one of the things that we, one of the methods that we use is the use of paralegals, which I think non-state non legal aid service provi providers in East Africa are familiar with. Our paralegals kept working from home and they were able to receive, um, to receive uh, and advise people on different, uh, different issues, 950, three cases we are reported by them and uh, they try to resolve some of them. We have statistics by gender, we have statistics, um, uh, what has been resolved amicably. And then they, they also created awareness uh, in their communities. Briefly, uh, I think, uh, as I conclude, the most important thing uh, that we saw and that worked for us was uh, the use of ICT. 
and uh, although I'm speaking, uh, as I said again, on, on behalf of my organization, but we see also this from uh, uh, the state uh, legal lead service provider. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Andrews, for that uh, very informative uh, presentation. Uh, I, I think the statistics that you've shared in terms of those you've been able to reach and support during this lockdown are quite, I, I think, bring out quite well the impact that you're doing on the ground. And I hope we can get comparable data also from our two other panelists. We move to Tanzania now, and we'll, be list we'll listen to uh, Tike Mwampipile, who is Executive Director of the Tanzania um, uh, Women Lawyers uh, Association, Taula. Miss um, Mwampipile, if, if you can, um, yes, I see your, your, your video is on. Uh, please proceed. You have 10 minutes. Okay, thank you for the invitation. Um, thank you, Felix, for the invitation, and uh, I'd look for, for inviting us to take part in this very important uh, meeting. Well, I'm supposed to talk about justice seekers' perspective on the prepar preparedness and response to access to justice need of women during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think uh, I have three key words, justice seekers, access to justice, and um, COVID-19, the effect of COVID-19 to women. Uh, so talk about justice seekers. Justice seekers, uh, for me, I've defined as, um, it could be me in case I have a, a legal issue. Uh, they also include judiciary, the uh, prosecution, law enforcers, defense lawyers, bar association, civil society, you mentioned. And uh, access to justice is the basic light, and I know most of us, we are aware of that. And in the absence of access to justice, people are unable to have their voices heard, exercise their right, challenge discrimination, or hold decision makers accountable. And... Uh, Are you still there? We seem to have lost you. Just give uh, TK one minute to see if she can be able to, to connect back. Then we'll continue. Hello, TK, you can hear me. Uh, please proceed. I think she, um, TK seems to have a connection challenge, so she has dropped off. Um, I'll give one minute to see if she can be able to reconnect. If not, then I'll proceed to the third panelist and then uh, she will pro, uh, continue once she is able to, to reconnect back. Okay, I think for the sake of time, I'll, let me move to the third panelist and then we'll come back again to, to Tanzania. No, actually, TK is back. TK, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All, all right, please proceed. All apologies for the network issues. So um, I'm not sure whether, um, okay, let me just start where I, I'm thinking I should start. Um, so I believe majority of us were not prepared uh, when we were hearing about COVID-19 in, in China. And then later it came to our own countries and still we are, most of, majority of us were not prepared. We didn't have policies in place, you know. And I think there was a lot of lessons that we had to learn out of the, this particular pandemic. And um, a United Nations policy brief on the impact of COVID-19 to women uh, warns of different impact on economic and productive lives of women and men. 
This attributed to the fact that across the globe, women earn less, save less, hold less secure job, and more, more likely to be employed in the informal sector. Because in, in this topic that I, I'm, 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 I'm discussing, um, the focus mainly, I'll be focusing on how uh, COVID-19 has impacted the women. And as a civil society organization, because we also work with the community, we work with the, with the people, how we were able to engage and to ensure that at least uh, women are able to access justice. And uh, report from the media and legal aid clinic state that uh, during the COVID-19, uh, most of us, we were, COVID uh, brought about majority of people to stay home, eh, lockdown except our country, Tanzania, where now we were not on lockdown, but somehow we were also in the lockdown because most of the you know, uh, offices were somehow closed in, as much as we are saying that they are open, but still some of them were not, you know, people are scared of you know, engaging with people. So, so most people are scared to engage with people. So there was a lot of increase of GBV within the community uh, because uh, women were now subjected or forced to live with their abusers since majority of, of the abusers, uh, most of the time uh, are men, were now forced to stay at home. And uh, again, some of the people who are living in town, they had to go back to their home uh, villages. Now, when they went back to their hometown, still uh, they were exposing women to more Abuse. Now they were abused by their husband, and later on, they 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 also the the relatives who came from the city were also abusing the and also the burden. You know, now they had to work more than how they were supposed to be working. And talking about access to to justice, it has been hard for women also to access justice, uh, both from the formal and the uh, informal structures. This was because. Uh, most of the, because most of the women depend on, on legal aid clinic and uh, most of the legal aid clinics were closed. And uh, if, even those who were open like ourselves still, uh, we used not to work at the pace as we used to, to do even before COVID-19. And on, on top of that, uh, the courts were open, yes, but still uh, most of the cases were being postponed to later dates. So somehow to access justice was a bit difficult for, for the women to access, to access justice. And despite the fact there was a lot of increase of uh, um, GBV cases that were happening. And uh, what have been our thoughts as, uh, you know, as service providers? Uh, and I think, like I said earlier, majority of us were in shock. And uh, we didn't have policies in place uh, within our organization. At the same time, as a country as a whole also, I believe even in the other countries, we didn't have policies in place, you know, to deal with this particular pandemic or any other pandemic if, 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 they, were, if they were to happen. So I, I believe this COVID-19 has availed an opportunity. It's a blessing in disguise somehow, because now we've been availed opportunity for us justice sectors to examine the ways the justice system can become more efficient and again, while long with dealing with issues like this particular pandemic, there's also a need to develop strategies to strengthen policies, regulations, the capac capacities of justice sector to continue providing essential services during crisis without jeopardizing the health of service pro providers and those who seek justice. But at the same time, we also need uh, to invest more in the communication and technology infrastructure because uh, most of the time we are dealing with people at the remote, not like we used to engage uh, with people used to come to our legal aid clinic, let's say, or they will go to court directly and engage. But now uh, even some of the cases, you know, the, 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 the courts, we are hearing through the, you know, uh, ICT through the, through the, uh, uh, the use of ICT. So I think there is a need for us to invest a lot in this particular area. 
because uh, now we are dealing a lot with the online engagement. But I, I also think one of the area that we need a lot to invest more is the hotline services, because now that's where you are able to engage with someone direct and give advice. But at the same time, the victim of gender-based violence who cannot, you know, go to the legal aid clinics are able to, you know, to get the services through their uh, through their phone because we know majority of people own telephones. But I also think these particular um, services should also uh, the government should also put in place a mechanism where now we are going to not only to uh, this should be done by the civil society, but also the government should also try their level best to ensure we have hotlines throughout the country and they should also work 24 hours. Um, again, as we all know, during this particular pandemic, women and children have faced and still face risk of violence and, and there there's a need uh, there's a need to develop um, analysis, comprehensive gender analysis. I think it's very important now. Uh, it can be done within country, but because now we are discussing as East Africans, uh, I think it's very uh, important to ensure that um, this particular analysis is done so that at the end of the day, um, we're able to see or look at the measures uh, on how we can prevent GBV to happen uh, during these times uh, of uh, difficulties like a pandemic where now uh, women are facing a lot of, uh, you know, GBV and a lot of, um, and then they can also, they, 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 we cannot uh, access to justice system. So uh, in a nutshell, that's what I thought I should share. Thank you, uh, Ms. Mopimpile, um, for sharing the experience of, the unique experience, if I may say, of Tanzania, uh, where, where you've indicated that despite um, the lack of lockdown, as, as, as has been in many of the other countries, that justice services were still affected, and women actually bore the brand uh, of the lack of um, uh, services within the justice sector as well. Uh, I want to encourage um, uh, participants to continue posting your questions on the on the on the chat or the or the Q and A, and we'll have a, uh, a Q and A uh, session immediately after the last uh, speaker. So I would want now to move to back to Uganda and uh, want to invite Ms. Fiona Wall, who is the the president uh, of the Uganda Law Society. Actually, um, in, I think Fiona, you're just one month old in your position, and you have um, um, you have ten minutes yeah. to share the perspective of Uganda with regard to COVID-19 response, uh, particularly from both from lawyers, the lawyers' perspective, but also from uh, the legal aid um, uh, practitioners' perspective as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Felix. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, during our early stages of this pandemic, uh, it was evident that there was a strategic disconnect between some of the justice actors. Um, just to introduce, uh, first of all, greetings to everybody that I have seen. Uh, thank you for all the presentations, uh, especially uh, as regards uh, access to justice in this context. And um, I think a lot has been said on Uganda's perspective, and I'm really talking about the practitioner's perspective uh, on the COVID-19 uh, response by justice actors, but just uh, to, to dive in there. Um, on 21st March 2020, we reported our first COVID-19 case and more stringent measures were issued by the chief justice, but that effectively shut down courts as they restricted the number of justice of judicial officers and staff allowed at any given court at any time. Um, at the beginning of, of, of this uh, on 31st March, uh, mm -hmm. additional stringent measures were issued that uh, shut down the country. And during this lockdown, uh, some certain essential services were allowed to to move, uh, but the judiciary and the, the courts and the service providers were not looked at, uh, the advocates were not looked at as an essential service. Um, 
the accessibility of judicial processes at this time during uh, such as arraignment, taking of pleas, ETC, were given little or no thought. However, as, as, as it, it continued, it became abundantly clear that there was a need to ensure a speedy response by the justice system to assess which measures should be prioritized. So as the previous speaker said, um, we were all caught unaware. So even for the for the state actors, it was um, a learning opportunity, a learning process. Uh, they eventually opened up the courts partially and still lawyers were not seen as an essential service at some point. They gave us only 30 stickers, which made it very, very difficult. Um, I think that uh, in hindsight, if they had involved women's organizations and other civil society organizations in this process, it would have been um, very important to consider the particular obstacles in accessing justice uh, faced by specific groups like women and vulnerable communities. This strategy would have taken into consideration historical and structural inequalities facing our different groups in accessing justice and how these may be exacerbated because of such a crisis. Um, within one month of the lockdown, according to a New Vision article on 11th August 2020, the Uganda police force recorded more than 3,000 cases of domestic violence and six deaths. Now, imagine this happening in a in a state where the courts are literally shut down, um, the, there are no lawyers, the lawyers don't have access to transportation, there's a lockdown, and then the prisons are literally also locked down. So this created potential negative consequences. Um, in the early phases, we had a lot of um, much, much as our government attempts to do the lockdown immediately curtailed the spread, which was a very good thing, we there was there was no initiation of the enforcement agencies into a holistic understanding of how the new normal would affect the public. For example, if police had the power to arrest people for a breach of curfew and they apply this power, they applied this power rigorously, this tended to overwhelm the courts and increase the spread of the virus which could have been a, a, a foreseeable risk at some point. Indeed, evidence shows that a rise was seen during the pandemic time uh, in this vigilance. And um, His Excellency, the President of Uganda, I think uh, Justice Abode also spoke to it. Uh, mm -hmm. On 22nd April, he, had, he pardoned 833 prisoners countrywide uh, through the prerogative of mercy as a measure against spread of COVID-19. And we applauded this. Another challenge we faced was the court's ability, the court's inability uh, to hold online sessions or they were they had innovated and created this uh, in order to fast track, but there were so many challenges because a lot of uh, prisons were not uh, prepared for this. A lot of advocates did not have access to their clients. Uh, so it posed a real challenge and um, Although we needed to upload the attempts at video conferencing at the Buganda Road Court and the maximum prison at Luzera. Um, there were people who were eligible for release at times that were deprived of their lib liberty uh, for longer than necessary, which exposed them probably to a higher risk of contracting COVID-19. So on, on, on the aspect of enabling justice systems to develop business continuity plans, COVID-19 has posed a real challenge for this. And uh, we need to look at um, priority should have been given to cases involving, for instance, child offenders, crimes against children, violence against women and children, because we saw a rise, as I told you again, in SGBV cases during this time. Um, we also saw the law enforcement agencies make this a human rights degradation uh, scandal because a lot of course, cases were seen as police enforced the presidential directives in total disregard of uh, the human rights of the people that they were arresting, according to Article 4 of the, 44 of the Constitution. And um, additionally, a challenge was first working in line with the requirements with the right to fair hearing under eight, Article 28. As I told you, uh, the justice system was uh, literally um, paralyzed at this time. The determination of these matters was urgent. However, um, 
determining what was urgent and what wasn't was also a real challenge that the, the, the judiciary faced. While um, we had serious cases of incarceration, human rights violation, even in the context of state of emergencies, including victims of unnecessary disproportionate or discriminatory applications of limitation or emergency measures. I would like to applaud Justice Abodo because at some point they had arrested about 300 women up north who are selling food. And um, I remember a magistrate had actually remanded all of them for failure to pay bail money, which was very expensive, and Justice Abodo helped in their relief. Um, access to personal protective. I also want to say that the JLO sector had a steering committee at the time to deal with these emergency measures. They did very well, although at the point of, there was a point at which we felt they were planning uh, but the planning was not even what is not exactly involving uh, the bar. Now, the Uganda Law Society has a legal aid project, and uh, I want to say that just using an, an, an example there, justice actors, especially legal aid service providers, including justice centers and everybody, started innovating, and with the help of our partners like UN Women, um, we were able to come up with toll free lines. Our people were working from home, but they were able to walk miles and ensure that people got justice. We were able to also go to the prisons and ask for special certificates to, uh, uh, to access some of our prisoners. It was very difficult, but in some areas it was done. And I'm proud to say that in the three months of the lockdown, we as the legal aid project of the Uganda Law Society were able to handle about 5,000 cases successfully of SGBV especially. Um, the pandemic also show, shone a light on the brutality of the agencies and an article in the, British, in the BBC entitled Uganda where security forces may be more deadly than coronavirus pointed out that in Uganda, at least two people had allegedly been killed by security officers enforcing measures to restrict the spread of the virus, while the country had only just reported its first death from COVID-19. Now, for me, this just shows that um, in future, we have to look at everybody being trained and being aware, everybody being, uh, of course, there are people who will violate these, these things, and we applaud the officials for working very fast and working very hard to curtail the spread. But we need to train our officers, especially the rapid response teams, the, the, the state agencies on how to handle such a crisis without, uh, without it being at the expense of the human rights of Ugandans. So that's just a rough picture of what happened for the, for the, uh, from our perspective as, as service providers um, on, on, on what the justice actors were doing for us. Um, it has developed a lot of things. It has accelerated our use of, of, of online applications and tools, and we are hoping that uh, we will probably plan better in future. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Fiona. I think it's unfortunate we couldn't see you on video, but I hope when you have oh. the questions coming to you. I thought my video then... was on. Sorry. No, no, it wasn't on, but you can put it on when you have questions coming to you. Okay. Um, okay. I want to request that we, we give five minutes to Honorable Amange, who um, wasn't able to connect early in the first uh, panel. Uh, Honorable Judith Omanke, the, uh, the, the High Court um, Registrar in, in Kenya. If, if you are available, if you're ready, uh, please proceed. And I'll request you take five minutes. Sorry to cut your time. No problem, Felix. I hope I'm audible now. Yes, you are. If you can put on the video, please. I'm being told the host has to start my video. Okay, I think that's okay now. Perfect. I'm very sorry about the earlier hitches, but I will try to just now uh, go straight to the point, but I thank IDLO for organizing this webinar and the rest of the uh, panelists for the very insightful uh, presentations. Uh, most of it has been covered, so I will not now repeat what has already been said. But they just to mention the judiciary in Kenya faced similar challenges like the other judiciaries. And uh, the collaborative approach worked also very well for us as uh, uh, Conrad has uh, been able to share. And we were able to prioritize what did we need to do uh, within the circumstances that we could. 
some of the results that we were able to get from the work that went on at that time was that we had uh, 7,000 judgments and rulings were written within a period of a month, which was really good uh, considering people were working in a, a situation of tension and uh, everybody really was facing extra challenges. But under the guidance of NCAJ, we were able to achieve that. We were also able to release at least uh, 4,442 prisoners, that's from the High Court, uh, to, uh, as a result of the decongestion program. But when you take into account the numbers that were also uh, released by the magistracy, uh, the figures uh, would be higher, which I will be providing later uh, in the presentation, which I will share in the, the paper, which I will share. Uh, in addition, because our staff had to work from home, we were able to allocate them work which they could do at home. We had to quickly move to review our HR policies and uh, we gave them even equipment to be able to work from home. Uh, so we were able to get quite a number of proceedings typed. Again, uh, 4,100 uh, proceedings were typed in different cases, which could now go on appeal, uh, proceed on appeal because they had been waiting for uh, the typing of proceedings. Now, uh, uh, when I'll go, the, the, I think the greatest, um, uh, let's say, achievement we had uh, as a result of this COVID, if, so, if it could be called that, because uh, it was really, it's been really something uh, quite um, difficult for everybody in the world to deal with. But for us in the judiciary, one of the positives we celebrate here in Kenya was the adoption of the use of ICT. And uh, we at first started very basic by saying that now that we close the courts, we are accepting emails. And that email has been adapted across the country. You find you go to a very distant court, like I was in Taveta, which is really on the border of Kenya and Tanzania. And they tell you, we are now getting emails from our clients. It has been accepted now as a use of communication. Uh, but in Nairobi is where we had really the greatest uh, achievement because we were able to use, uh, we were able to, um, implement the e-filing, which I know IDLO has really had been at the forefront of supporting. And uh, as of uh, the end of uh, uh, 30th of, uh, of, of September, uh, we've been able to register a total of 11,383 cases on that system. And this is really uh, something we celebrate considering we didn't have enough time even to do the capacity building, which we would have done if we had a longer period. We were really uh, firefighting, so to speak, as we implemented it. But I think the leadership from the top also assisted uh, because the Honorable Chief Justice led from the top in ensuring that uh, the judges, the magistrates, and even the advocates were able to embrace the use of the e-filing uh, uh, system. So that has worked very, very well. We were also able to set up a customer care center to deal with concerns. And again, this has come up in the other presentation. So uh, I will not go into detail, but it has also helped in just uh, managing some of the concerns that the public had at this time. What are some of the lessons we learned? I think for me, the most important lesson is that uh, crisis can be an effective catalyst uh, for change and innovation. Uh, we had tried to automate. In fact, a lot of the background work had been done on automation, such as uh, use of the case tracking system. But the, the, uh, uh, what we were able to achieve in the six short months was only possible because of the crisis. Then we also learned that uh, collaboration is important. Not only did we collaborate at uh, policy level of the NCAJ, but on the ground, the court users committees, uh, which bring together various um, uh, stakeholders, were very critical in um, uh, just ensuring the courts were able, the public was able to work together with us uh, in the, on this journey and able to come up with localized solutions really for some of the challenges that they were facing because we could only give broad guidelines but we then relied on stations now to come up with their own localized solutions. So this was uh, really um, brought together other agencies at the court user committee level, which who really contributed to that. Then uh, we were also able to learn that communication was important and uh, the public, we constantly communicated with them on various forums through the chief justice uh, giving press conferences, but also through the social media. And they did not hesitate to give us feedback in the social media at times they were very um, rough on us when they wanted uh, uh, the certain concerns they were raising, but we liked that engagement and we we're going forward, we will continue to have uh, the same engagement with the public. Uh, what are some of the gaps that we still have in terms of access to justice that we are working on and uh, it would need a collaborative effort to, uh, uh, to address? 
Uh, the issue of psychosocial support, we still have a big gap there for litigants uh, who appear in uh, the most vulnerable litigants. Those are litigants in family cases, uh, litigants in uh, children cases, uh, litigants uh, who have been uh, the, the, the victims of domestic violence and, uh, and all the, 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 the sexual offenses. We, we are, it's still work in progress to see how the courts can be able to support them. Uh, I say that even two parents who are fighting over custody of a child need psychosocial support. Unfortunately, the law does not address some of these concerns. So it is something that we'll be continuing to work on as a judiciary and with help uh, from uh, our stakeholders to address these concerns. Then of course, legal representation has been discussed at length, so I will not go into it, but it is also a gap. We still have a challenge in terms of legal representation. Then we will need to work together with the stakeholders to, uh, to incorporate the best practices from this uh, season into uh, effective case management techniques, which will be employed by all the courts across the board. So that is work that will be work in progress and we will need the support of our stakeholders in this. Then we are also uh, pursuing court annex mediation and other forms of ADR, which we think can also help um, in terms of accessing justice for some of our most vulnerable uh, groups. And uh, we have, especially in family and children matters, they're better settled in that kind of environment. And luckily, those are the eight cases where we've had a lot of successes. I won't give the statistics now because of time, uh, but we are pursuing that and we hope that that can be done. Then uh, we are looking at also um, how do we, how in, in future, and I think this has been raised by the, uh, the court users who have spoken uh, just before, the panelists who have spoken just before, how can we ensure that in future when we have such incidents, the vulnerable groups, their rights are dealt with totally separately. I know we tried in the judiciary, we said for sexual offenses cases, they would proceed even in spite of the challenges we had. We also came up with an information kiosk to assist uh, vulnerable groups to um, access the, uh, the courts uh, or the, the, the online platforms. But I think more can be done as uh, a country if we all put our heads together uh, to be able to uh, address the special, very special needs that they have. For instance, I think some of them have been talked about, they were now in the, the, in the, 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 the perpetrators were now with their victims with no access to police stations, literally. There were a lot of challenges that I think will need um, uh, a common approach and further discussions to see how we can come up with solutions in future. So thank you very much for that. I'm sorry I have rushed, but uh, uh, I'm very happy to have been given this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Amangi. And sorry to, to have rushed you. I, I know you had uh, way much more to be able to share with us, but we will, uh, of course, benefit from the from the paper that you were to speak. Mm -hmm. um, we are proceeding with a, with a question and answer session. I have a few questions and we, we have limited time. So I'll just um, uh, read out a number of questions that have come from the floor. Um, I think there's a question for um, for Taula, for uh, TK, uh, for Matt Trom. Um, the question is, could you expand on your contention that despite the lack of lockdown, justice was still affected, particularly for women? Uh, let me just read out the questions to the different panelists and then you can all uh, speak in, in, in turn. So we'll start with you, TK. And then the other question that we have was for, uh, for uh, Rwanda Legal Aid Forum, for you, Andrews. Um, and the question is, uh, you mentioned using ICT, but some countries are suffering from dispensional uh, in infrastructure, entering justice accessibility especially for groups at rural areas which were already suffering from limited access before even the start of the pan pandemic. From your experiences, how could we overcome such difficulties? So you could just be able to share the Rwandan experience in trying to deal with the inequalities that also uh, use of ICT uh, brings about. And then um, a question to you, um, uh, Judy Honorable Amange from Martin uh, Scotsman's. Uh, sorry if I didn't get the name and didn't pronounce the name correctly. Have detainees in any of the countries been granted use of ICT to interact with their lawyers? Were they assisted by lawyers during the e-court uh, hearings? So those are the three questions that are that are, are being posed. So if we start with um, uh, with Taula, then we move to Andrews, uh, and then we come to Honorable Mange. Uh, thank you. Uh, you can, can enable the video. Um, okay. Uh, 
Thank you. Um, it's true, Tanzania, we were not on lockdown. And um, much as we are not on lockdown, um, majority of institution that were providing uh, legal aid to women closed their offices. And in the areas where the offices were not, uh, were not closed, very few people used to go to work. So it was a bit difficult uh, for women. And uh, we all know that most of the time, um, women do not have uh, money maybe to pay for court, uh, you know, court services because you need to pay. And so they really need legal aid clinic for assistance. And because now they were closing, then it was difficult for the women to access justice. But at the same time, and for those who are able to go to court, again, much as the court were open, but still, uh, I think most of us were in shock. Uh, most institutions were at that time in Tanzania around May and, and, and early June, we were in shock. So um, there was no substantive hearing of cases, uh, especially on family uh, cases. I do know most of the cases that affect women are family cases like, you know, uh, matrimonial cases, uh, issues to do with inheritance, issues to do with the land and all that. So they were put pending. Uh, but there were most of the cases that were being heard in court via uh, criminal uh, cases. But at the same time, if they, even admission of cases were there, was also uh, not so much. And in case a, a case would be admitted, then the, the date would be put at the later date. So, uh, so that's where, that's where I, I said there was a bit of, you know, uh, the, the justice uh, system was affected, especially for women, because of the two reasons that I've mentioned. And thank you very much uh, for that response. I think, Antus, you have uh, two okay. minutes. All right. Thank, um, thank you very much, uh, Felix. Uh, it's a very good question from uh, uh, the colleague. Um, first of all, when you, uh, I should say that um, the previous studies that we've been conducting, one of the things that has come out is the accessibility uh, by rural population of the services we provide. It's a challenge, I know. It's not only for Rwanda. So, one of the recommendations from our research was um, that how do you then uh, enable citizens to access simple information on law, uh, simple information on procedures, simple information on how they deal with their legal needs. And the platform that I just uh, presented about uh, earlier alone is coming in to answer that. So the first question we had to, to deal with was ex is exactly what the colleague is asking. How do you make sure that the rural area access all the information, uh, the, the possible information they may need for their legal, uh, their legal needs? So uh, in Rwanda, uh, as in many other countries, I think access to the ICT infrastructure is very hard. So we resorted to mobile technology, simple mobile technology, where you use simple phones. You don't have to have a smartphone access the services on this platform. For instance, uh, and one of the other factors that, uh, um, you know, uh, encourage us to come up with this solution is that uh, mobile penetration, at least in Rwanda, uh, is above 80%. And uh, mobile subscribe, subscribe, subscribers, we have close now to 10 million. That's already uh, a very good, um, that was a very good um, uh, point to leverage on using this simple mobile technology that does not require internet connectivity, does not require uh, sophisticated infrastructure. So our platform is based on that simple mobile technology where you can access uh, information, legal information that you, may, you, you need. So if some of you are considering to do that, like I said in the chat, you have first of all to do a, feas a feasibility study and find out what is possible for you. If, if internet, uh, penetration in your country is 100%, then you may, you may want to resort to other different platforms. As I know, they, they exist in, in paint out there. So my simple question to this is that um, we're using simple mobile technology. We have a lot of mobile sub subscribers. They don't need to have uh, internet. They, can, they, they use their simple mobile phones. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Andrews. Uh, Honored Boamange. 
Yes, thank you, Felix. Yes, yes. The answer to that question is that yes, the the the, the, the accused persons were able to get access to legal representation. Instead, depending on the capacity of the prisons, they could either get the, the legal access to their lawyers through uh, the online platforms because their stations, which came up with through their CUC court users committees, were able to purchase even equipment for the prisons, like Mombasa, for instance. So in those instances, they were able to access their lawyers through the online platforms. But in courts where it was not possible because the prisons perhaps did not have the right equipment uh, to be able to facilitate this, they organized for uh, uh, they organized for face-to-face -face, um, consultations with the lawyers. So like I said, it was different solutions for different courts based on the capacity of the courts in terms of equipment and uh, fac uh, facilities. Um, thank you, Honorable Amange. We we have. I, I think this question is is a bit general. Uh, and any of the uh, two panelists from Uganda can can be able to uh, to respond to this. It's from Chiro Mogeni. I think it's from Aikelo. And uh, for Uganda, what strategies have been used to reach out to enhance access to justice in in marginalized areas? I think you spoke to some of this in your in your presentation. But if there's anything else you want to add in terms of the strategies that have been used in Uganda, you can be able to speak. I think I can start with uh, with you, Fiona, and then also if the, um, if the DPP also wants to add something, you can do that. You have two minutes each. Um, yeah, and then we then wrap up the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. I hope you can see me now. Um, yes, yes, we can, yes. Okay. So, I had talked about the toll-free lines that that various uh, service providers were using. We also have uh, what we call a pro bono application. It's called Leader War, which uh, has um, you can uh, you can access it on Android, but it also has a USSD uh, accessibility for all the mobile phone users. As Mr. Kananga said, we also have a lot of mobile phone users, and they are able to reach us that way. We also um, kept doing a lot of um, information, information dissemination on radio stations. Uh, people are doing this and, and passing on flyers. So people even reported to us through the media and were able to reach uh, these situations because somehow the journalists were viewed as essential service providers. So they were everywhere that, that, that there was a ruckus so they need to, anybody needed help. We also had uh, what we call we have we had some lawyers on call at police stations uh we call this the duty council scheme and because of this uh every time people were arrested or booked in or something like that these lawyers were actually able to help process them thank you very much uh, thank, thank you fiona uh judge if you have any additional comment you'd like to, to add on that particular question you can and also if you can also give us your uh, concluding uh, remarks as well. Thank you, Felix. Uh, I don't have much to add on that. Fiona has uh, quite handled it exhaustively. I just wanted to make a comment as my concluding remarks on the, uh, there was a question on the JLO sector, the JLO secretariat, uh, what it has, uh, how, uh, how it has uh, impacted on us, uh, the jealous actors, during this COVID-19. I should say that the jealous is a sector-wide approach um, that was adapted by the government of Uganda. It brings together about 18 uh, institutions, which are closely linked with mandates of administering justice and, and maintaining law, order, and human rights into developing a common vision, policy framework. It focuses on a holistic approach to improving access to justice. During the lockdown, uh, just like uh, I said, it, 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 is like, it really brings together uh, uh, criminal justice institutions. It was able to bring together uh, a number of us institutions which are closely linked, the police, the ODPP, the judiciary and prisons. And there was also a task force for criminal justice actors, which was formed. We put together a statistics, which statistics of cases, of course, which helped us uh, to make um, uh, uh, decisions 
of how we can handle these cases uh, during this lockdown. We developed SOPs how to handle them and generally to strengthen the e-justice and a coordinated approach to these activities because we realized that at the beginning we were actually very uncoordinated, uh, but with the jellos coming into the picture and coordinating all of us, we, we had to make a response which was, uh, of course, a response should have been reasonable, proportionate, and of course it, it had to be coordinated. Otherwise, then would have uh, been very, uh, would have uh, caused more havoc than uh, the pandemic. So I just want to, to say thank you so much and uh, for inviting uh, the ODPP into this um, discussion. And I want to thank also the other panelists. I've learned a lot and I've taken quite a few uh, to, uh, to points to implement because we learn from each other. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Judge. And I also want to just echo where you stopped in terms of appreciating all of you panelists for uh, sparing time. I know you are all very busy. Uh, so spending time with us, sharing your experiences, and I think they don't come across. Before I turn over to my colleague, um, Teresa, to conclude, I just want to share, I think, two, two points that were, were shared uh, from, the, from, the, uh, from one of the participants, which I think um, it to be useful to, to think about this as, as we move forward. It's from uh, Donald, Don Dare uh, from the uh, Pan-African Lawyers Union, PALU, and, and Don says, I'm really impressed by the technological innovations that the Legal Aid Forum Rwanda has, has rolled out. Ideas here can be replicated, of course, with the necessary modifications to suit the local uh, context, literally throughout the region and the continent. Indeed, in several regards, COVID-19 has kicked up a storm on innovation in the legal or judicial services sector, as in many other places. And I think we can all largely agree, and that has come out quite clearly uh, from the presentations that we've had from the different panelists. Uh, I think it's a challenge for all of us to be able to think of how do we uh, continue to uh, deepen the use of innovations um, in ensuring that we're able to reach more people who need uh, justice services, but ensuring that as we do that, then we also don't then uh, deepen the inequalities that currently exist with regard to access to justice. Uh, mine is to thank you all, and then to turn over to, to Teresa, who will then be able to uh, provide uh, the closing remarks on behalf of IDLO. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felix, and thank you very much to our panelists for this afternoon. Um, we obviously underestimated the time that we did for this discussion because I still see that the questions are rolling in. We really would like to thank our panelists for taking the time to make the presentations, but also to share very valuable lessons and experiences with our attendees. I would like to particularly thank our attendees who have been with us from the very beginning. We appreciate your time. Um, as we have indicated in the chat, we will try our level best for those of us, that, for those of you that would like information from the panel. Uh, to please drop us an email and we'll do our best to get some of the further responses to your questions, to the issues that you have raised. As Felix said, I think we have learned that today this is an important platform that we can use to share experiences across the region. We are really grateful for the opportunity to be able to hear from the different countries and from the different perspectives, both from the service providers as well as from the um, uh, justice seekers themselves in terms of what are some of the innovations that have been going on in response to COVID-19 and ensuring that uh, we all have access to justice during crisis. But also I think there's some critical and key lessons that have been learned in terms of taking some of the innovations forward post the crisis. For example, issues around how do we decongest prisons and issues how, about how we can leverage on technology, including mobile courts within the prisons, but also using virtual platforms to actually hold court. So I think we have learned quite a number of uh, new things. And I think our panelists have learned from each other. And we hope that this is the beginning of the process where we can continuously engage on sharing ideas and also sharing ways in which we can enhance access to justice across the region. And of course, leveraging on the linkages that we have. So on behalf of the IDLO and my colleagues, Felix and Romaldo, I would like to say thank you very, very much for taking time to be with us. And we hope to be able to again come together very soon to continue the discussions around leveraging access to justice in these trying times. Thank you very much everyone and have a good day. <laughs>